Okay, cool. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome from everyone around the world. I see there's a few from different places, exotic places like Stellenbosch. Um, we're on webinar nine now, and this is one of my favorite topics. I've actually presented this in a different forum a couple of times before, and I really like it because I believe sports nutrition as we know it is more or less stuck in a one-dimensional way. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by that as we go through the presentation. Of course, we want three-dimensional things like pictures and three dimensions are much more pretty than a one-dimensional uh, object. But in order to get three dimensions, we need the first dimension and the second dimension. So with that, I'm going to make a start. We're going to make use of the chat box tonight. So you've already made a good, good start there. So what I want to know is, where are you in the world? Let's see how many countries we can represent. What's your profession, you know, background, nutrition, exercise, unrelated, athlete? And what would you like to learn from this evening's webinar? We're also going to use the chat box a little bit more than that as well, because I'm going to be asking you questions tonight. I'll, I'll do some role reversal. I'll do the usual and present, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about our short course that we've just started, um, and then we'll have a Q&A session. And if I paste it right, we should be at the Q&A after, say, 45 minutes. So thanks, guys, for your, your comments coming in. So look out for the questions. There is a prize to the person who contributes most to the chat tonight and gets most of the questions right or gives the best answers. So that'd be quite interesting. And the prize is a free place on uh, this short course that we are starting next week. And I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, so let's go to the first dimension. And in the picture there, you'll see a lot of carbohydrates. So we're talking about macros here. And sports nutrition loves the macros, the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins. So that's what the first section is going to be about. So quiz question number one. Now that you know the first dimension, it's about fueling the mitochondria, start pondering about what the second and third dimensions might be. But don't think too hard because then you'll miss what I'm trying to say about the first dimension. So if you've done exercise physiology, nutrition, biochemistry, this might give you a fright because you maybe don't want to go there again. I could throw in a quiz question please name all the steps of the Krebs cycle, but that would be a bit cruel. So it's there to illustrate, this is from McCardell Catch and Catch, which is a very well-known exercise physiology textbook. So this is the standard view of the Krebs cycle with um, um, glycolysis feeding in, and then of course you'll get oxidative phosphorylation spinning off to create ATP. So you're putting fuel in one end and you're getting ATP or energy out at the other. This is a wider view where you can see glycolysis feeding down into the Krebs. You've got beta oxidation taking care of the fat and ultimately you're spinning off a few electrons from the Krebs cycle, which feed down the electron transport chain and, and produce ATP. So if you follow the, the little table at the bottom, you'll realize that you get a lot more ATP from fat because they're bigger, chunkier molecules. So it's more the slow burn kind of effect that we get from fat. It's kind of, I, I equate it with diesel and petrol. Diesel will <clears throat> keep a truck chugging along the road for many, many miles, whereas the petrol you need for zippier kind of actions, okay? So that's the, the introduction to fueling the mitochondria because of course the Krebs cycle 
is within the mitochondria. Yeah, and sorry about him, there's no shared screen coming up. Are you not seeing the slides progressing? No, no. Uh, okay, right. Thank you, Paul. Let me just start that again. Yeah, sorry, I'm not reading the uh, comments as well. So let's share. I'll do a different method of sharing. Share the whole de desktop. Oh, wait. Okay, right. Please comment if you're seeing it all changing now. Or give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'll just fizz through it. Right, so Krebs cycle, obviously you, you were stuck on the first slide. So a reminder what, of what the Krebs cycle looks like. There's a bigger view bringing in beta oxidation and glycolysis. And then quiz, quiz number two is, what might the disadvantage be of consuming a high fat, low carb diet in the context of high intensity performance? I've kind of answered it, but I want you to kind of phrase it up, have a think about what that might be. And I'm gonna properly answer in a few minutes. So we have, sorry, I just need to get the um, participants up again, so I can let people in. So we have a 50 year plus car carbohydrate paradigm, which, yeah, literally, from the time this study was done, this was a year before I, were, before I was born. And it was the kind of studies that were uh, done in those days. They loved doing muscle biopsy, sticking a big ne needle in a, in a leg and pulling out a bunch of muscle and looking at the starch content or the glycogen content. So this slide basically shows if you follow a group of runners who do 10 miles every single day, don't do any particular, particularly special fueling strategies, that glycogen levels can gradually decrease over time. So therefore, it's very important to make sure you get enough glycogen to support that exercise. But of course, you know, why do we need glycogen? Well, we, we need it for part of our fuel. And since we went back such a long way, I literally just turned 50 this year. So a couple of years ago, I did a 50 year review in the FSN magazine. And basically sports nutrition evolved out of the exercise physiologist laboratory from the 1960s, meaning the they could measure what they could measure, right? So they did a lot of treadmill, a lot of cycling um, type tests with athletes, and then they could measure muscle biopsies very easily. So glycogen was a low hanging fruit that they could easily measure. And that shaped the start of this. And um, it really kind of had a big effect of this 50 year carbohydrate paradigm. And we had early research studies such as this one by Coyle, where they, they fueled people with um, a solution of glucose. It would be about 6% glucose solution every 20 minutes during a 70% of VO2 peak run to exhaustion. All right. And the placebo was in the red, and that's basically just sweetened water. And what you could find is about a 50% greater time to exhaustion. And at the time, many years ago, um, likes of Lucozaid and Gatorade and all the big manufacturers would be talking about, hey, take our drink and you'll get a 50% greater time to exhaustion. Well, they probably framed it a little bit differently, like you'll have a 50% greater performance, which is slightly different. But that's the early research that was quite conclusive in that way. It hasn't changed much. This one um, was to do with intermittent sprinting. Um, and a lot of athletes are not just steady endurance athletes, say they have to stop, start, stop, stop, start, or they might exercise, they might train in an, uh, a repeated sprint or an interval type session. So there are very, very clear differences with the carbohydrate fueling with these early studies. 
This is a little bit more up to date with uh, Justin Roberts. Uh, he's a close colleague of mine in Cambridge. Um, and he did a trial of placebo in black versus multidextrin in blue. Multidextrin is a glucose polymer. So glucose is a substrate that's mostly been looked at over the years. Multidextrin is just a chain of glucose and it's very easy to break down into glucose. So it's very much similar in the effect. So you can see the carbohydrate oxidation is much, much higher if you use sugar versus placebo. The red shows you fructose being added. So fructose has a different carrier, meaning that you can uh, actually get more sugar into circulation in a, in a given time. So you, you could see this in action with um, James Morton. I think it was about 2018. He was looking after Team Sky and, um, and Chris Froome was at, on his best form. He was in the Giro d'Italia. He was in second place. I think it was two or three days from the end. And they just did this very strategic management of handing out bottles that had this mixture with fructose added. And they're very diligent about handing out at regular intervals. And it kept him fueled through this very difficult hilly stage and he ended up winning the stage and getting the margin he needed for the win. So that was quite a famous use of this event, a use of this information. Now I'm coming back to the, the quiz question I asked you a couple of minutes ago, and that is, what would be the disadvantage to relying too much on fat? And the, the basic thing, I can already see that some of you are getting this and have good answers here. Fat is your diesel. It only turns over at a certain rate. So you don't want to rely 100% on it. Now, give or take, the fat max rate is generally about 60% of VO2 max in general. You're going to see differently in a minute. Carbohydrate can push you up to VO2 max or the, the full aerobic expression. And then anaerobically turning over carbohydrate, which is basically carbs down through glycolysis. Instead of spinning around the Krebs cycle, you push off to make lactate, get a lactate buildup. So you can't do it for a very long, but you can sprint and you can do a very intense effort. You need carbohydrates to do these upper ranges. Okay, so it's not as efficient, but you get a better rate with the carbs a better amount of volume and endurance capability with fat. So in essence, we need both of them. We have the biochemistry for both of these substrates. So we, we need to use them. But what's happened is we've had a bit of a pendulum swing. We've gone from this low fat, high carb, so carb is king mentality to over the last 10, 20 years, 20 years in general nutrition, 10 years more in sports nutrition. We've had to some switch around of thinking. And now fat, fat is fab. And there's been some quite prolific research as well. We've had the likes of Tim Noakes, who uh, I know from Cape Town, who's really got behind the whole banting scene, which is sort of semi going towards the ketogenic approach. We've had ketogenic approaches being studied in sport. And I'm gonna share one with you. Oh, just before that, with this picture, I always ask the question, what, what lies in the middle? We'll come back to that in a minute. So what about fat? Let's introduce this guy, Volek. So just a few years ago, so fairly recent, he took a bunch of uh, uh, runners and divided them into two groups. One group was on a sort of standard sports type diet with um, carbohydrate percentage of in the 50s, as is generally the, the way with sports oriented diets. And then he took another group and he put them on pretty much a ketogenic approach. It was 70% of calories coming from fat, which doesn't really leave much space for protein and carbs, does it? Um, what he found was 
this peak fat oxidation that I just talked about is generally around about 60% on average. By doing this manipulation, he could push it up sort of 10%, which is great. That's really impressive. And it really opens up the intrigue as to the benefits for longer distance events. But most events we're talking about are done at above 70% of VO2 max. So we need to recognize the limitations of fat there. This is the overall fat oxidation rate, and you can see it was a lot higher in the low carb state than in the, the high carb state. But there was another graph with a study showing that the carb oxidation was greatly knocked down in the high fat state. So you might actually, by taking this approach, decrease the efficacy of burning carbs and make, it, make yourself metabolically less flexible. I like that term, metabolic flexibility, that's becoming popular. Okay, so some nice research, but we need to, I think it throws up more questions. Oh, why has the screen gone black? Oh, it's gone white. Apologies for those who uh, have seen this sketch before, but it represents the black white thinking of scientists often. They'll sit on one side or another and kind of fight their case. I like to think about what's in the middle. This is a scatter plot. And this guy popularized the, this scientific word, outliers. So outliers are the guys that sit right out here on the edge. So low carb, high fat, they do really well. And I've met some of them, not many. And on this side, we've got maybe a vegan diet. It does really well on lots of legumes and, and whole grains. But scatter plots are known for, well, the majority are somewhere in the middle or left or right of the middle. So I ask the question, what about a moderate fat diet? But it really hasn't been studied apart from this very old study that I found from 2001. And what they suggest is that higher levels of fat in the diet, up to 40%. So at that time, that was considered a high fat diet. When I did nutritional therapy and I started looking at, okay, well, what's, a, what's a healthy diet for a person? And then I analyzed it. 40% fat was um, becoming more commonly what I was recommending to people. So to me, that's a balanced diet. It's not this high carb sports diet that we're accustomed to, but it's not a ketogenic approach either. It's something moderate. But anyway, this moderate diet had a really good effect on performance and it actually supported cortisol and, the, and you know, modulated the inflammatory cytokines that might happen with hard exercise. Whereas what has been shown on a low carb diet these things can fly up quite high and cause physiological stress. So here's a black white scale that I created. And where are you? Where do you want your food to be? Where is your, where are your athletes? In the middle? Left of center, right of center. It's like politics and it really is in science. So that's a healthy balanced diet. We genetically have preferences left or right of the middle. But then we've got the far end, the extremes, and to me, they're manipulations. Some people can carry them out long term, but most people, it's a short term manipulation to maybe lose some weight or to stimulate better fat metabolism, for example. Okay, so that, that rounds up the end of the first dimension, looking at the macros. How do we balance up these macros for the, the support of fuel going into the mitochondria for that individual person? Okay, so the second dimension is to me deep nourishment. And you can see that in the picture behind here. There's a lot of different variety of foods in this color and diversity. So let's go through this. These are two examples of um, set calorie diets that I took out of well 
you know, very popular sports nutrition textbooks that I have in my bookshelf. So they're recommended enough that at some point I bought them to aid my studies. But let's look at this stuff. I've just pulled out a few items that are in here. You know, it's white and brown galore, you know. I, I'm just lost for words with the lack of nutrition going into these diets. I mean, margarine and French fries, really? I do miss bagels. I used to race on bagels when I lived in the States. But yeah, you cannot fuel an athlete. Well, you can fuel an athlete, but you can't nourish an athlete with these diets. So let's introduce a new concept. So we've got this graph on the left-hand side by Bailey et al. in 2009. And they did some intervention to increase time to exhaustion in cyclists by quite a marked amount. And it wasn't glucose, it was something different. And then on the right-hand side here, we have maximum voluntary contraction, contractile force. So it was strong efforts in the gym and then looking at recovery. And this element improved recovery a great deal. What were these magic things? Ah, food. So in the last decade, we have seen a, um, a start of the food first approach within sports nutrition, which has got me excited. It's only really looked at in an ergogenic way though, whereas I look at it physiologically, how can we improve the health of that individual by thinking in this way? So beetroot, yeah, I love it. Uh, it's, it's supplies nitrates, nitrates are vasodilatory, which is why several trials now have shown better endurance performance, which is great. But what about cardiovascular health? What about antioxidants? What about um, betaine? Betaine has multiple roles in the body as well. And then we get cherries. So cherries have a strong antioxidant effect. Certain type of cherries have even have melatonin in them. So some people use them for sleep quality. So that's quite exciting. So I went I, I use various things for sports drinks. So I used to live in Stellenbosch and uh, it got me thinking about grapes because it's a big wine district. So I started drinking grape juice for sports drinks. And then I added pomegranate after a trip to Israel when I had pure pomegranate juice, obviously diluted down. So I thought, well, let's see what's in the literature. And I found funky stuff like sugar cane juice. Now, have you ever tasted sugarcane juice? I mean, it's delicious. I've tasted it in Singapore where they just squeeze it and it's full of minerals. It's full of good stuff. That white powder stuff, you know, it's completely, completely different. Okay, so sugarcane juice could be as effective as a sports drink. Well, yeah. There's a honey drink. So one of the DIY sports drinks I will do is a homemade iced tea made out of either green tea or a rooibos or red bush tea, um, which are antioxidant um, rich. And then you add in honey or agave nectar or coconut sugar or something to bring in the sweetness. And then cashew apple juice, you know, I'm going a bit funky here. And then we get other stuff like acai berry date syrup, juice, watermelon. And yeah, we're only limited by our imagination here. The research is out there in many, many spheres. Uh, one of my current student uh, students just wrote up a really nice article on pomegranate juice and it's packed full of antioxidants. And it's my favorite juice to even race on. I used to do cycle races and I remember doing a 100 kilometer cycle race on pomegranate, diluted pomegranate juice with some glutamine and electrolytes till about halfway through. And then I had to pull the powders out of my pocket for the second half. It, it wasn't as good, even though it was an organic, really good quality sports drink. Okay, so let's go a little bit further and talk about sourcing. Where do we get our food from? If we're talking about food first, where does it come from? 
And just as you know, there's a lot of detail on this slide you can look at in your own time. By the way, you'll get the slides uh, by email tomorrow. But I just want to kind of give this little story. We get an organic box scheme once a week, which comes from a nearby organic farm. We top up at Morrison's, which is one of the British supermarkets. And we have nearby farmers that just do small things and will have you know, very big seasonality. So we have farmer Jim who's just down the road and we've got some of his carrots. They're all sorts of shapes covered in dirt. So at one time we had farmer Jim's carrots, organic box carrots, and some Morrison's organic carrots, i.e. the best that money could buy from the supermarket. I did a taste test with my family, so my wife and two kids, and blind taste, all of them. It was farmer gym first, organic box second, supermarket third. So if you just change out a carrot for a carrot, or a tomato for a tomato. Have you tasted tomatoes in Greece? I mean, they're just different. So let's try and find the best tomatoes we can. So that's what sourcing is about. And then the next stage is putting it all together, which is what my wife does as a natural chef. How can you prepare food to maximize the nutritional elements of that? So quiz number three. What are the cofactors for glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation? Okay, got you thinking there. What's coming to mind? I'm going to give you just a few seconds before I give you the answers. There's the Krebs cycle again. What do you think? Punch them in the chat box. Okay, NAD plus isn't a cofactor, but it's in the Krebs. Think about what NAD plus is made out of. Okay, B vitamins, magnesium, yes. Carnitine, not specifically carnitine. It does help. Vitamins and minerals, yes, but general. Here's what's required to drive this Krebs cycle that the exercise physiology textbook tells you you just need fats and carbs for. We need to up it. We need to really up it. We need to think about, okay, where are we getting all these B vitamins from? Where are we getting the magnesium, the manganese, the cysteine, the iron? Um, the oxidative phosphorylation also needs uh, CoQ10 and iron. There's like poet, which you'll find in authentic fatty products uh, like poic acid. So I, I did a little chart. This website, unfortunately, has disappeared now, the world's healthiest foods, but it was great. If you wanted to know the best food sources for a nutrient, you could just type it and find a really nice table in their website. So this, if you look through this, there's huge food diversity, a lot of different types of food, colors of foods, um, textures of food, okay? And that is nutrition. It's not these whites and browns that we saw in that table at the first, at the start of this section. Okay, so there's the Krebs cycle, but I think we're still quite zoomed in, aren't we? So let's step back a little bit. Sorry, that was a bit of a jerky transition there. And let's look at the, the bigger view of the, of the mitochondria. So what do we see? Well, inside all that biochemistry is happening, but we see something that's wrapped up with a, a nice membrane. So what, what do we need to support that membrane? Your mitochondria needs to get ADP and AMP into the mitochondria and then ATP back out to fuel the, or to support, energize the cell. Um, it's, it's got a really important role, but it's also highly vulnerable to damage. So let's think how we might nourish it. Now, this is the kind of biochemistry that we're seeing now. And if you like biochemistry, you're probably really excited about this diagram. If you don't, then it will be, whoa, okay, too much, too much. I'll just talk about this PGC1A. PGC1A is understood along with nerve one and two and other factors 
to be a really good stimulator of mit mitochondrial biogenesis, which has lots of positive spin-off effects. So obviously, if you make more mitochondria and you nourish and repair more mitochondria, which is part of that process, as an athlete, you should be better off because one of the reasons you go and train is to produce more mitochondria or to increase their capacity. So this is all really good. And if you look at, across the top here, what drives this mitochondrial biogenesis? It's all different aspects of physiological stress. And we might term that hormesis. So hormesis is a mild stress that creates a physiological change for the better. Training is hormesis, but we're in an era of talking about cold water immersion and calorie restriction and intermittent fasting and so on. So let's go over to the next, the next slide. There's calorie restriction up there and we can obviously add all the other things. But in a way we can overdo the hormesis to the point it becomes destructive to our body. We can overdo the intermittent fasting so that, that we're too much in a catabolic state and not anabolic enough. We can overdo cold water immersion so that it actually stresses our system. Like skinny me, I, I can't do the cold water immersion too much, but maybe in a very controlled way. So you can overdo anything that's good for you. What I like about this slide is we're starting to add in real foods or components of real foods. So to me, this is nourishing of mitochondria. Um, and a lot of these have strong antioxidant roles. And I'm just gonna pick on one and that's quercetin. So I could pick on any of those. So variety in, in our diet is really, really key. So this is David Neiman, who's uh, really well known for exercise immunology. And he used, he went through a phase of really being fascinated by quercetin. And he did a trial, it was a beastly treadmill test with or with, that, with placebo or quercetin. And he found the performance improved with the quercetin and they get an increase in mitochondrial DNA activity, meaning more mitochondrial. Hi, uh, my name is Angela. I'm calling on behalf of the dietitian, Holly. Okay, sorry, Angela, right, I'm just hello? gonna have to mute you there. Um, so, got, got a bit of a surprise there. Oh, okay, all right. Oh. Um. Okay, right, back to work. So quercetin, can be a really, really, really positive thing, not only as an ergogenic aid, but health, because we're talking about mitochondria here. So where do we find quercetin? Well, food. So here's a few examples. Let's get more onions into our stir fries. Let's eat more apples. Um, let's, I mentioned apple juice as a potential sports drink. What about berries? banana and berry smoothie as a post-exercise. Let's find those Greek tomatoes. Let's get the cruciferous vegetables, which also support our liver processes. Let's get some green tea, maybe substitute in some of those coffees for the green tea, although coffee is good as well. Um, and cacao, so really, really dark chocolate. All of these have research on them. So quiz number four. What is the most notice noticeable component of the next three slides? Here we go. So this is a pretty salad made by my wife, Rachel. A few smoothies, variety, got some berries in there. And you've seen this picture before. This was the front cover of our book, Wholesome Nutrition. Um, just really looking at good quality food. Okay, raw. You're right, but you're wrong. It's not what I'm looking for. Thank you, variety of color, 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 antioxidant, yes. So that's the second element. If you remember color, you've got the second element, the second dimension, but more than that, we're nourishing the mitochondria, we're nourishing the biochemistry by understanding the cofactors 
but we're also nourishing the mitochondria, right? So let's go into the third one, quiz number five. So beyond that deep nourishment of our mitochondria, what more can we possibly do? What else do you think might help our mitochondria, which in turn will help our health and our performance? Have a ponder. Hydration, fiber, detox. Yeah, detox. I'll put detox in the last one, but yeah, it's also part of this one. Reduce inflammation, recover well. Oh, there's one by... Uh, Anna Maria, that I'm going to come to. Okay, so firstly, we need to personalize because I haven't really talked about that yet. We need a personalized approach of uh, N equals one and understanding the individual and what their requirements are. We need to think a little bit differently. We need to think outside the box. And this book by Noble and Boyd was bought for me and all my classmates in 1994 when we graduated from Glasgow University. And it was by a bunch of really forward thinking physiologists and they're semi-philosophers as well. And it was at the time when molecular biology was coming in, so much more physiology was done through a microscope and electron microscopes. And it was getting them a, a bit worried because we're looking too deep. So what they said is what characterizes them, sorry, I need to move our pictures. Sorry, what characterizes what they, which I've added in as physiologist, scientist, practitioner, coach, are doing, we suggest, it's not the apparatus they use, but rather the way they think. Lovely, thank you, really nice. So you see she's looking down, I like to do that, but I also prefer to look up. And notice I've added in a child rather than an adult because a child has childlike wonder and imagination and more natural creativity than us adults. So let's open up that box, get out of the box that we're actually sitting in. Beginner's mindset approach. Thanks, Jenny, I like that. So let's think more complex complexity. So this is a close colleague of mine, James. I used to work in his clinic in Cape Town. And this is his mind. He's a thoroughly complex mind. He's a biokineticist. So you can see the uh, functional medicine ATMs here. You get stress, movement, hydration, sleep, relationships. There's your thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and then spinning off in various directions cellular pathways, systems, cardiovascular, energy pathways, activity, nutrients. So we can go as wide and as complex as we actually want to, which is really quite exciting. So imagination is the only thing we have limiting our ability to nourish ourselves and the people we work with. So back to this little book, another cracking quote, the significance of a molecular biology feature must be seen in the context of higher order systems, whole cells, whole organs, whole organisms, even species and their environments. And this marries up very nicely with the guy I'm looking at right now on my screen, Paula Wren, who wrote this cracking article a couple of years ago in FSN magazine. And he went a lot wider. He, he shared the story of a judo champion that he, he helped who basically lived in a dorm for 10 years. And that's a very different ecosystem to somebody who lives in a nice flat and has home cooked dinners every single night. So what's around us challenges our being. And it, it drops down right down to the cellular level as we will see in a moment. So we've got our mitochondria. We've looked at it through the microscope. Let's take out that telescope and start zooming out a little bit. So we need to initially recognize the muscle fibers that they lie within, the muscle belly that it's within, or other organs, the whole being that that mitochondria is in, and their environment, which might look like this, or it might look like this. 
most of us, it's the second option now. And this is really, really key. Where do they, where, what are they surrounded by? Where, what are their stresses? Where's the uh, pollution, the toxicity in their lives or lack of it? So this is a spot the difference um, slide here. So just quickly type in the box what, what you're seeing here. Yeah, you're too slow, too slow. So on the left-hand side, we have bacteria. On the right-hand side, we have mitochondria. And you see how similar they look. And there's been a bit of a revolution in you know, how we're actually thinking about these little critters um, in the last few years. So firstly, I wanna just share how important our mitochondria are. If, if you're coming from an exercise perspective, it's all about you know, how quickly your, your muscles can turn over, fatigability, um, intense exercise, et cetera. So it's about muscle and, and heart, mitochondria. But mitochondria are in every organ, organ system and insufficiency or dysfunction have been associated with every single one of these. And by the way, in my clinic in Johannesburg, which is a very stressed out city, these were the primary two, along with autoimmunity disorders I was dealing with in athletes because they just pushed, push, 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 and then an imbalance starts to creep in. So let's bring in this really nice new revelation. The mitochondria are descendants of primordial aerobic pleomorphic bacteria. Don't say that after a couple of glasses of wine. The microbiome is an essential supplier of metabolites that act at the level of mitochondria and skeletal muscles to stabilize host metabolism. Cracking. So in other words, if we nourish our gut, we'll be nourishing our mitochondria at the same time. So I've just put in this random slide because we had apples in the quercetin slide earlier. This is the effect of stewed apples on our microbiome, our positive bacteria. And by the way, it's been shown that people that work um, live in a rural environment, especially if they get their hands dirty, have a much better, more balanced and diverse microbiome than urban devel uh, dwellers. Okay, so if we're living urbanly, how can we change that? Can we get a little allotment plot and do some gardening? Can we uh, do some fermenting at home? Can we take some probiotics and prebiotics and be aware of our fiber that supports our prebiotic support? So the gut axes are really, really important here. I think the gut brain axis is almost like old hat now. So we've been talking about the gut mit mitochondrial axis, which is actually more direct than we realize because if we nourish the bacteria, we directly nourish the mitochondria. But if we bring in good antioxidant levels, we're nourishing our mitochondria. If we bring in all those cofactors. Conversely, if we just have that fuel mindset and getting in enough carbs for competition, what happens if somebody has a mild intolerance to gluten? So there's a threshold amount, they just eat too much bread or pasta and it irritates the gut. That will adversely affect the micro microbiome and intestinal permeability, which will cause an inflammatory effect throughout the body, et cetera, et cetera. So there are other axes like the immune axis, musculoskeletal axis or the gut muscle axis. We're, we're now hearing of the thyroid axis and the lung axis. Um, I'm sure we'll fill in every body part within the next decade as well. So final, my final step, I asked you what more can we do to nourish the mitochondria? And the clue here beyond nourishing our gut and our immune health, is psychological health. Okay, so this is fairly new stuff and really exciting stuff. 
An emerging concept proposes that mitochondria sense, integrate, and transduce psychosocial and behavioral factors into cellular and molecular modifications. Isn't that worded beautifully? Quite complex. But it's more than just psychology affects the mitochondria. It's the mitochondria are beings. They're, uh, they're bacteria, after all, that pick up energy. So we need to positively support that energy and, and really be aware of negative energy, such as depression and anxiety and big stresses in our lives that could be sending the mitochondria health in the other direction. So this is a little um, diagram that they put together. So on the right-hand side, you can see this sensing through to signaling, funneling effect from brain to mitochondrial health. And then across the top, you've got different life aspects. So I've got a colleague, Patricia Warby, who is really passionate in this area of psychology and mitochondrial health. So she'll talk about ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences, which are again, more airtime now, nowadays, thankfully, which can feed down and affect all these parts of our physiology, impacted also by our current behaviors, which can then negatively affect all these downstream aspects, such as inflammation, mitochondrial health, telomere shortening, and then obviously affect our health in a negative way. And I know my, my friend Paul, who's online, is very passionate about the, the health span as opposed to lifespan. So as athletes, we often get into it for health reasons. So we need to know this type of information rather than putting more stress through our body mind and creating problems down the line. Okay, so that's me finished there. I'm just going to, oh, sorry. Uh, my final word, which isn't actually my final word. It's just, uh, I found this really nice. Historically, it's been noted that progress within individual fields of in investigation can be hindered by a lack of understanding of the relationship across fields. And so it is with sports nutrition. But thankfully, we're starting to reach out. Things like the microbiome is starting to get into sports nutrition, which is quite exciting. So we're gradually opening up to different possibilities. So as I say, you'll get the slides tomorrow. There's tons of references you can follow up. And then before we do q and I'm just going to tell you about the short course. So we've got a certificate course, which is quite a big course. It takes about 30 weeks with three modules to do. This is, um, it gives you a, a taster. It gives you a kind of deep dive quickly over four weeks. And we're starting it next week. And it's about 10 hours, give or take, of your time between the weekly Zoom meetings and readings and videos that you can do at home. So week one. It's like the bigger course, we're going into functional integrative body system health within a sporting context. Week two is more performance oriented nutrition aspects, including hydration, your macros, your nutrient timings. Week three, we're going more specialized and we're, we picked two topics to do. One is hypertrophy and the other is overtraining. And the last one is you'll get a 30 minute um, chat with me. And that's simply to just ask me what you like and I can help you with resources and ideas and that sort of thing. So these are all the contact details. Um, the cost of it, yeah, I almost forgot that, but cost is 199. So it's, you know, it's accessible to most people. And there's a 10% discount for band members, bases members, and also students, okay? And as I said, I will be reviewing the chat box and whoever's been most active tonight will uh, get a chance to come on that course. Okay, I'll just unshare. And open for questions. Um, if you like, you can unmute and, and just come on and ask a question to save the, the lag with the chat box. Okay. 
Ian, I've got a question. Go ahead, um, Amanda. So I know uh, Stacy Sims and others have been doing research in women athletes um, as the estrogen and progesterone are rising before they actually have ovulation and, and then menstruation and the different needs during that time. Is that something your long course gets into at all? Um, we have two significant lectures on female health. Um, one is a sort of classic physiological uh, understanding of, let's say, the dance, the dance of the female hormones and how that might be affected by, by exercise. The other one is a more of a genetic view of the estrogen cycle. Okay. So it's diving more into biochemistry and detoxification and all the different nutrient pathways required to support that. So, so yeah, I think we represent it in a good degree, but you can, if you get further questions, because these ladies are quite knowledgeable, you can get more questions asked. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Ian, a couple of uh, it's not it's not so much questions rather than comments. And probably on a couple of my sort of like favorite subjects. The whole question on athletes. Um, I think the question of how much elite performance actually affects health and whether it's the choice between one and the other. Um, it was a conversation I was having with a with a friend of mine who's about my age and used to be a very good triathlete. And both of us now are paying the ferryman for 20 years of elite competition at completely different sports. And leading on from there, my whole lifespan, health span thing, looking at longevity after sports, the take that I've seen recently on it, which leads on from everything that you've been saying recently, is how long do you want to live and live well? And to achieve that, what do you want to be doing when you've actually reached that age? What can you still want to be doing? Getting up off the floor, walking upstairs, and what have you got to do now to actually achieve that? And obviously everything that you've spoken about during this lecture is a huge part of that. But I think the majority of people here or a good number of them will be dealing with elite athletes. And it's a subject we've discussed a number of times before, I know, Ian, but that trade-off between elite performance and good health, I always find very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're pursuing the, the very highest, there's always a trade-off. But I think hopefully what, what you'll see tonight, you've seen tonight is with a little bit of better physiological understanding rather than just the fuel provides the energy approach and you're constantly nourishing and supporting, you can at least reduce some of that. And what, one of my interests is, or fascinations, I remember interviewing, uh, oh, she's gone out of my head, but an elite British uh, long distance runner, Joe Pavey, um, for one of the magazines and she'd hit age 40 and she was winning stuff and I'm like how did you do that that's incredible she was winning more than she had when she was 30 um, so the fascination is how did she pace herself and I didn't get nutritional answers I got lifestyle answers she'd had a couple of kids and it, it brought her life into better contrast of what's important so her training wasn't like, you know, hard hitting the way it used to be. So she probably actually inadvertently did less over training because she had other things in her life. So there's so many different components. Um, but then you've got, I mean, yes, there'll be a lot of people that deal with elite athletes. Um, there's a lot of people that deal with recreational athletes as well. And that, that was kind of my basic client people that still had to do the day job, but were out doing cycling, running events, triathlon events, long distance stuff often. And 
how could we support them to just nourish their body? How could we actually identify with their training that they're overdoing it and opening up these conversations with their coaches who thought they were doing the best job by pummeling their athletes? And you're saying, well, actually, you're pushing them over the edge and they're not getting this nice super compensation rebound from their training. So there's a lot of really, really important questions that need to be asked. Um, Will, um, I saw you were unmuted earlier. Did you uh, want to say yeah. something? Actually, yeah, because I, I can add to what you're saying a little bit um, for Paul's benefit as well, really. Um, I I was recommended to, sorry, can you hear me? Well, I don't know if my signal's any good. Um, I was recommended to come and, and listen to this by a friend who I think is also here now listening. Hello, Bev. Um, it, I found it really interesting. Thank you. Um, I've been implementing a training protocol um, on, a, on a rest and work basis to kick in my myokinase system to help to increase the size and strength of my mitochondria. And I found it's worked really, really well. So from Paul's question of, of sort of being able to train on for longevity rather than anything else and to sort of an anti-aging almost effect with your training. Um, Paul, I recommend you look at a book called Quick and the Dead by Pavel Tuslin, um, which teaches a protocol that, that does just that. It, it, it's based on the idea of, um, of increasing that mitochondrial growth by stripping your ATP down to ADP, then temporarily down to an AMP, and then allowing a recovery enough to stimulate that change, just like a muscular growth, but within the mitochondria. Um, but also, I wanted to touch on the idea of um, the damage of cortisol, perhaps within that system as well, because I've suffered physical and mental burnout from overtraining and stress. And it's, it's kind of been a chain reaction of mental stress caused me to overtrain, which caused physical stress, which caused mental stress, which caused just flat on the floor and having to scrape myself up. So it's quite an interesting for me, yeah, just a link to all of that. Uh, thanks, Will, for uh, sharing that. That's really interesting. And your sort of deliberate manipulation of AMP. So for those who, who don't know, when we use up ATP, we lose a phosphate and it becomes adenosine diphosphate. We lose another one, it becomes a adenosine monophosphate or AMP. And that is one of the stimulators of that big pathway I share, shared earlier, the scary biochemistry slide. Um, so we can induce that, but everything's a double-edged sword. So something you mentioned there is it's a deliberate manipulation, but then you need to get the recovery right. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, and you should start spiking the cortisol and dampening. So the recovery. book I mentioned, which the book I mentioned, which clearly isn't my work, uh, The Quick and the Dead, um, you you work on a uh, so we're doing kettlebell snatches and the kettlebell snatches are done either every 30 seconds you do five so you end up with about 10 15 seconds work so you burn into that a through the atp into the adp and then you rest for the remainder of the 30 seconds you do that four times so you're in two minutes and then you take two minutes off and it's enough to kind of take you to the like the poisons in the dose it takes you to the edge so you're not stripping down your 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 a-frame if you like you're not getting a, a, a huge amount of acid in there to, to to take apart that that framework but you're allowing enough it has to be a high intensity work so the snatch is perfect um if it was a press it's not enough to gas you out enough to do the job um there are certain exercises uh, swings and press ups work really well um viking presses work well but like i say slow lifts grinds just don't do it but um yeah it's like you say the dose is in the poison very much so it's interesting yeah. how we're getting like training schedules with a scientific element of it now mm -hmm. um because like that that description of your work out there in the past, you would have had a very tuned in coach who could sense how much dose versus recovery to work with their athletes. Um, whereas we've got into this era 
I'll call it the CrossFit era. Anyone who knows me knows I like to bully CrossFit. <laughs> Take CrossFit and keep it. Um, because it's it's push, 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 push without enough recovery. I used to, in the 80s and 90s, do and coach old-fashioned circuits. And it was generally 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for maybe eight, eight exercises. So that'd be, what, four minutes? Have a good rest, do it again. So it's a similar type thing, as opposed to do one exercise and then straight into another, straight into another. So yeah, in your terms, gash you out maybe a bit too much. And then the recovery. You end up free radical production, huge amount of free radical production from overtraining like that, from what I understand, which is obviously no good. Yeah. Uh, the sort of, um, again, massive amount of cortisol, massive amount of stress, which in turn, in over time, your body just won't come back from. It doesn't like it. Yeah. So just picking up, Jenny, I love strength training and CrossFit. <laughs> Craig. Um, so I'll put this into context. I don't want to bully CrossFit, but um, there are very good CrossFit coaches out there who can contextualize for their athletes. I knew one in Cape Town that I worked with, and he, he was a really nicely balanced individual. Whereas CrossFit can attract these ego-filled coaches as well. So it depends on your coaches. It really, really does. But you can say that about anything. Because, um, yeah, I worked with a triathlete coach in Johannesburg who just pounded our athletes. So did the other one. So did the other. It's a, it's a culture. So we need to move beyond cultures and start thinking and feeling. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions. Is there any impact of injuries on mitochondrial function in athletes? Impact of injuries. Well, obviously, during injuries, you're going to be breaking down mitochondria, which are part of the tissue. Um, and then you have to recover that. And once you're back, you need to slowly build up by that progressive training because we, we train to increase mitochondrial biogenesis, not just the food. Um, I initially read that in the, the other way around and mitochondrial function with injuries, which would be an interesting one as well if we're overburdening our mitochondria and there's a lot of oxidative stress. I would imagine that you're more injury prone in that tissue as well. So again, there's a lot of philo uh, philosophy in this. I remember doing coaching courses uh, when I was younger. I was an athlete, I was a runner. And the best coaches were described as scientists and artists. They had both, they could pull from both, but you could add in philosophy as well. And one of the best philosophers I know is uh, Paul, who you've, you've heard talk tonight. He's able to take a discipline like, you know, ecosystems and, and really contextualize that information for the person. Okay, Claire. Um, I'm seeing so much of the effects. Oh, just went up there. I'm seeing so much of the effects of a uh, connection between the mind and gut with my 15 year old. I'm looking into this as much as I can to assist him in his sports and general health. Thank you for making this information accessible. Okay, so there wasn't a question there, but yes, the, the gut brain axis, and then obviously the gut connects with the mitochondrial function. It connects with, I think your kids are quite sporty, Claire. Um, it connects with their sporting output as well, plus their recovery. Okay, anything else? Have you got time for, for one more question, Ian? Yeah, go for it, Jenny. Thank you so much. I found it fascinating. So thank you, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm actually working with a CrossFit coach at the moment. Um, she's really switched on with her nutrition. Uh, but what's interesting and what's made me quite excited after this evening, actually, is she's got a growing number of um, food intolerances and also some rosacea. So we've done a stool test and um, we're working on a gut protocol at the moment. But it's interesting because she's an elite athlete. She's in the master's category, um, really high level. But uh, she sort of mentioned that she also feels like she's firing on sort of three out of four cylinders. So. I'm really excited to see if the gut protocol that we're going to, um, you know, introduce and, and that kind of uh, the restorative work on the gut microbiome is going to translate to 
benefits to her recovery and her training and her energy. So um, really excited. But would you do a stool test as standard with your your athletes? That's the next question, really. I don't do anything as standard, to be honest. Okay. Because, because of financials. You know, yeah. I lived in South Africa for 12 years and getting the good functional tests and changing it into RANDs, suddenly they were paying like five or six times my cons- my early my early yeah. rate to do one yeah. test. So it was, so yeah. I, I learned to live without them a lot, but in more advanced cases, I would definitely use them. Yeah. So for athletes, it depends on their situation. So I tune in a lot through my questionnaire and just really listening to them and hearing their story. Sure. And do they need that? Mm. So in your case, you got an elite athlete. Um, obviously, you, there's a lot you could do. In some cases, you can pick the low-hanging fruit and, and just yeah. make some obvious dietary changes and say, okay, well, let's do some metrics mm. and see how you're improving. So if they're an athlete, let's pick a couple of different exercises and do performance tests. Yeah. Maybe throw in some HRV. Okay. I also use a daily training stress score as well. Yeah. So a mixture of subjective and objective ways of telling how how they are and how they're doing with your your inputs. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Cool. Thanks, Jenny. Um, okay, so we're now at 10 past seven. So um, unless there's any Oh, Will's just said, how about breathing yoga? Um, that's an interesting one. I thought all yoga was breathing, but uh, I get your, get your point there. There'll be different aspects of breathing that can stimulate there are, the parasympathetic. There are different... Sorry. On you yeah, go, there, there are different, different techniques for breathing, different methods, different um, yeah, ways that you, you move your body and hold breath and release breath um, that, as you say, will will stimulate all kinds of different parts. So, sorry, it was just touching on what you said about picking the low-hanging fruit. Um, yeah. There are loads of things that I, I, I've benefited massively from a couple of different breathing techniques in regards to my digestive system and um, uh, the ability to, um, yes, uh, well, clear clear out for want of a better sort of um reset myself yeah. um, there's a few techniques within pranayama that that are specifically for that purpose so will is a really nice example of a modern balanced switched on athlete so well if everyone was like that we would have no clients um so i'm glad not glad we still get some clients but yeah there's so many different ways that we can go about it and yoga i love it um you need to figure out the right kind of yoga for the person breathing is really fundamental i've got a colleague alex ferretti who will say very clearly i don't like yoga i don't like meditation but he's a karate master's black belt he says put me in the woods behind my house and i'll do slow movement uh, slow moving karate moves and he measures it on his HRV and he says he has a really excellent effect. I've, I've personally started doing some Tai Chi and Qigong and I'm working on, it sounds a bit uh, esoteric, but the heaven and earth kind of connection and movement of energy across different planes. And uh, I'm finding that really good. So you can, you can target that into gut health. You can target into musculoskeletal health. You can bring it into recuperation strategies. And you've got the yin-yang balance, which I really like, because the majority of athletes spend their whole time in yang, which is your stimulatory sympathetic nervous system. We need to actively find ways of yin to rebalance them. So yeah, breathing is is fundamental. Um, Pre-bed strategies, obviously how they eat is important. So talking about gut health, First thing I do is give out pre-eating strategies to get them slowing down. Are you religious? No? Well, you're going to pay thanks to your food anyway. So slow down, 
thank somebody for your food, breathe, you know, and different aspects like that. So, yeah, thank you. I've uh, really enjoyed tonight and thank you for your contributions. Next thank month, you. I'm doing it again um, and we're going to go into my uh, macros. So we'll stay more of that um, first dimensional but we'll go off in different directions and kind of debating style. And I might even bring in a couple of people to stimulate debate as well. And then, as I said, the short course starts next week. So if you're potentially interested in the work we do, come and have a look. Um, that's just a, a small commitment of time. So thank you and have a wonderful month.